At this point, we will be calling upon our speaker from Cohn Resnick to deliver his presentation. We're very happy to have Cohn Resnick with us this evening. I'd like to thank Stephanie Conley for all of her efforts for arranging for Richard Shabak to speak to the association this evening. Richard Shabak is a director at Cohn Resnick and a member of the firm's tax practice. Richard has almost 14 years of diversified public accounting experience with an extensive background in providing tax services to clients in various industries. His expertise includes repair regulations, percentage of completion taxation, cost segregation studies, tax planning consultant, consulting, and IRS examination support in connection with accounting method issues. Prior to joining Cohn Resnick, Richard worked for a top 10 accounting firm as a director in its strategic federal tax services group and was the leader of that firm's West Region Accounting Methods practice. He has also worked as an attorney advisor in the IRS's Office of Income Tax and Accounting where he provided advice on tax accounting method issues. He has authored or co-authored articles that have been published for Tax Advisor, the Tax Executive, and the National Association of Manufacturers. He has also spoken at numerous events for the Tax Executive Institute, the American Bar Association, and the American Institute for Certified Public Accountants, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Richard Shabak of Cone Resident. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, the, the first thought I have is, is that uh, going through that bio is I need to shorten my bio. <laughs> so I'll, I'll work on that the next time. And um, uh, the other thing I'd like to do is thank whoever, there's someone over here who applauded when, uh, when it was meant for tax. And I appreciate, I think that false motivation is better than no motivation at all. So I appreciate that. And then thirdly, um, to the extent that you don't like the topic, let's blame Jack. <laughs> so with that, um, in all seriousness, um, my background is um, I'm a tax director at co Resnick, was with another firm, I've been doing this for a while, and I've, I've lived through the history of what is now being referred to as the, uh, the repair regulations. And the reason why um, <clears throat> folks are super interested in this is uh, building owners and property developers, and this, this is who it applies to primarily, uh, are now given a, an opportunity from a tax perspective to deduct a ton of costs uh, or accelerate a ton of costs for tax purposes and get deductions way earlier than they would have gotten uh, before. Now, for those of you who have any familiarity with um, cost segregation, this is conceptually similar because what you're doing is taking property uh, or costs and where you would have received the benefit of the deductions over 39 years, what you're doing is taking that and, and accelerating it and getting the deduction in the current year. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so this has been a hot issue. And then, I'm like, Stephanie, if you could just drive the slides for me. Um, so anyway, the bad news is, is this is about tax. The good news is Jeff told me to keep it to 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. So there are, these, there are these tax rules that came out. They've been kicking around in proposed and temporary form for like eight years. Finally, they came out and they're effective this year. And a bunch of accountants in a room one day sat down and figured out, wow, if we compare what our clients are doing now with these new rules, this creates a significant opportunity for building owners and property developers to accelerate a bunch of deductions. And the more property you have, the better your chances are of accelerating a ton of deductions. Um, so all this slide is saying that um, these are regulations that are effective for 1114. What tended to happen was companies sort of knew about this for a while. They didn't really do much about it. And this is the re really the year that you have to do something about it. Um, and, and, you know, by the way, if you don't get to it this year, which you should, if you don't get to it this year, you will just do it on your 2015 tax return. So who does this affect primarily? 
Uh, the, the biggest winners here are going to be the property developers and are going to be the, um, uh, you know, anybody holding a large real estate holding. Could be manufacturers, could be other industries, but those are really the big winners. It's really going to affect everyone, so everyone should be doing something this year. Um, what do we need to do for 2014? Uh, all the taxpayers have to apply these rules. Uh, it really, in order to apply these rules, uh, or any new <coughs> IRS pronouncements, it takes the filing of a form with the IRS, and that needs to be done by your extended due date for your tax return. So for companies that don't extend their tax return, a lot of them are filing now, between now and April 15th. Uh, it needs to be done by then. If they extend, then you get out to the extended due date. Um, and of course, if you don't get to it this year, like I said before, there still may be a chance to do it for 2015. Okay, so not to get overly technical, there are a couple of code sections that the, the regulations deal with. Um, you don't really need to know the numbers, but for those of you who are familiar with depreciation, uh, some of the rules fall into the depreciation sections, and then some of the other rules fall into the capitalization sections, and when you take these two rules together, that's where you get the benefit. <clears throat> so you can see at the bottom of the slide, there are six major areas, and the IRS put out about 400 pages of regulations about 200 pages of which, and that's the irony too, because this is an area where there's a lot of controversy. So the IRS said, you know what, in order to reduce complexity, we're going to put out 400 pages of regulations. <laughs> uh, and then on top of that, another 100 pages of procedural guidance. And then, um, as, as Stephanie knows, um, every week, seemingly, the IRS says something new about this. And we try to, to push the word out to the folks who are actually preparing the tax returns. And it's super frustrating because everything seems to change from day to day. Um, <clears throat> six areas, the first three really are not going to be a major interest to real, um, real estate owners. Uh, the, the last three really would be. So what this has to do with is uh, when you do, or you have repair and maintenance costs in connection with buildings, the question is always going to be, is what you do to the building now, is it significant enough where I have to capitalize the cost. And by capitalizing the cost, I mean, it goes on the fixed asset schedule on your balance sheet, and you end up recovering the expenses over 39 years or 15 years, depending on the type of property. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, and you don't need to know these words, but there are three tests in the regulations, and really what they're aimed at um, is betterments, is restoration, and is adaptation of the property to another different use. So the example I would use is if you have a building and you have 10 rooftop units on the building, you would go through this three-part test. So let's say some of the rooftop units go bad and you have to replace the rooftop units. Uh, it's been my experience that a lot of times, whether it's one rooftop unit, two, three, four, uh, building owners are capitalizing that and then recovering the costs over a long period of time, usually 39 years for tax purposes. So the analysis goes like this. The, the veterans criteria, which is the first one, that's asking whether you've, you've made the building better qualitatively, you've increased the capacity, strength, um, uh, it, it basically you've made it better. So one example of that might be <clears throat> if you swapped out a rooftop unit or a couple of rooftop units and you're adding tonnage to it, so now you have more efficient or stronger HVAC units on the roof, um, that's a situation where you'd have to capitalize the cost. But now let's change the back pattern. If you change out two of your 10 rooftop units, but you really did like for like, and you haven't really changed anything else and you're putting in comparable stuff, well, instead of capitalizing that cost, you can just deduct it and take the expense down for tax purposes, which is a great answer. Pardon? Now, there's a great question here about technology changes. So the IRS put in what they call the appropriate comparison test. So the IRS realizes that if you haven't changed your HVAC in 10 or 15 years, that technology has changed. So the way I boil this down is, if I had sort of a middle of the road HVAC unit before, and I'm replacing it with a middle of the road HVAC unit now, then that's like for like. But if you had a middle of the road HVAC unit and you replace it with top of the line now, then you're gonna have a capitalizable event. Um, the last test on the slide is adaptation to a newer different use. I'm going to change the fact pattern from the HVAC example um, to a, 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 a company that owns a retail strip mall, for example. And there are examples in the regulations where 
um, let's say it's a pharmacy or a grocery store, and in the example of the regulations, they had the pharmacy, the pharmacy does what it normally does. <clears throat> the other thing they did was they took a few hundred square feet of the store and turned it into a clinic, which they never had before. So in the example of the regulations, they said, well, we adapted that to a new different use. They had to capitalize the cost. Even though when you looked at the building, the building wasn't really better. It's just the same, it's the same footprint as the same four walls. The HVAC wasn't really changed. Uh, but the IRS came up with this rule for new or different use. Um, so those are the, the three major categories. <clears throat> um, the other example I guess will bring up for new or different use. Well, I think I think if you're looking at, if, if, did you get the question up front? So, and, and I'm going to I'm going to try to repeat the question to make sure I got it right. So, you're, you're doing something to the building in order to bring jobs to the community, and the question was whether that would fall into the new or different use. Um, I don't know that the IRS would point to that. In fact, the IRS used to try to point to. I'm going to use a retail example. The IRS used to point at every refresh in a retail setting and say that's an improvement. And we say, why? And they say, well, you're, you're doing this to bring customers in, so it must be better, and therefore you have to capitalize it. And we say, well, that's not the rule. The rule is whether did we make the building bigger, did we make it qualitatively better somehow, or the lighting is more efficient, or the HVAC is more powerful, um, so that that concept of there may be an indirect benefit, that's not really what's going to cause you to capitalize it. The other example I just thought of, too, now is um, there were different uses. You had a manufacturer, and you had a bunch of factories, and they took one of the factories and converted the building into a showroom. And so I guess the change in use, so you had to capitalize that. Um, so what you need to take away from this is the fact that there is three tests. In order to get to deductibility, you have to run through the three tests. And the other thing you want to remember is that for most taxpayers, this is going to be a, a, a pretty big benefit, or it could be a big benefit if you have a lot of real property and you do a lot of repairs. <clears throat> the other place where there's an opportunity is for landlords with tenant improvements and if you own the building for a while and you keep you know, demolishing one tenant improvement, building another, demolishing one, building another, um, if, if, if each of the tenant improvements is a relatively small percentage of the building, then I would say you have the potential to deduct that. Obviously, I'd probably have, in, in real life, I'd have like 10 more questions to ask you, but um, just know that if you have a situation where you're building a bunch of tenant improvements and you keep demolishing and rebuilding, then you may have an opportunity there to take additional deductions. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so this, what this all comes down to is the unit of property concept, and I think like a fraction. So if the building is a unit of property, that's your denominator. And the question is, what's the numerator? What have I done? And, and is what I've done significant enough? And the, the, in the old rules, the building is always the unit of property. If you did HVAC, you compared it to the building. If you did plumbing, you compared it to the building. Well, you change the rules a little bit. Now when you touch a system like plumbing, electrical, HVAC, elevator, escalator, um, there are eight systems they broke out. Uh, if you're doing that, they, they tell you to compare it vis-a-vis -vis the system. So now if I'm looking at HVAC, and I say, well, is that HVAC, uh, uh, is, 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 that, is that significant vis-a-vis -vis the system? Uh, it used to be, is it, was it significant vis be the building overall? Um, so you see there, there are various rules for buildings, and then you don't care about the bottom view, which are planned property network uh, assets. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide, something. There is, um, this is pretty significant. So under the prior law, the building was a building was a building. And under, for tax purposes, you couldn't take a partial disposition of something. Either you dispose of the whole asset, or you have the asset. <clears throat> so if we go back to an HVAC example, if you took HVAC or, or rooftop units off your roof, nobody would have taken a deduction for that. You didn't dispose of the whole building, you just dispose of a couple of rooftop units. Um, now what they've done is, if you want to do it, this is completely elective, they've given taxpayers the ability, under certain circumstances, um, to go back in and write it off. If you're throwing out those rooftop units, if you can figure out the cost basis, which is another story, you can go back in and write it off, and they call it a partial disposition, but take a deduction, uh, and they call it a loss on uh, partial disposition, but take a deduction 
equal to the net basis of those assets. Um, this is the, probably the more complicated part of the regulations, and I think less taxpayers will do this. Um, but it is a significant opportunity. In fact, the IRS gave taxpayers the ability to look back at their historic assets and ask, are there any costs in my fixed asset schedule that I could write off now um, that have been incurred in prior years? And, and the ability to do that look back is only in 2014. Next slide. Um, there, there are certain procedures to implement the rules. There are a lot of rules. Some of these are just elections, which means you, you attach a statement to your tax return. And then other items are changes in accounting method. And the difference there is that for the changes in accounting method, you actually attach a form. And you send the form, and this whole completed form to the IRS, which includes statements telling the IRS what you're doing. Uh, and that, that form 3115 is called, that gets attached to, uh, to your tax return by the extended due date, if you do extend. And um, and that's that's that. I mean, there could be up to three or four things that you have to, to make the accounting that you changes for. Uh, the IRS is given tax is a limited ability to lump some of that stuff together on one form. Um, again, the reason for implementation, the big thing here is the ability to accelerate deductions. Um, I think that's the, the more interesting reason to comply. Uh, but the more important reason to comply is this is now law. So in reality. Um, even if you happen to have an unfavorable result as a result of these new rules, you still have to comply. But I want to always emphasize the positive and tell you that there's an opportunity there for a lot of companies. Uh, but even if there's not, you still have to comply. Uh, depending on the size of the company and the type of company, uh, if, if your company is being audited, the auditors are going to ask uh, more than likely what you're doing with this and whether you considered it. And you should probably have an answer for them. Uh, there are ways, if you're not in, if you're not willing or it's rather uh, interested in availing yourself of the accelerated deductions, there are certain elections you can make. You just want to make your life easy and make these certain elections and not even bother, bother with it. There are ways to do that as well. Uh, forward one, please. Um, so how do you do this? In reality, what you have to do is look at your tax fixed asset work papers and see what's in there. And if you're seeing things like uh, roof repairs, HVAC repairs, parking lot repays, um, remodeling uh, uh, entryways, uh, replacing windows, shingles on roofs, whatever, um, any of those types of things are potentially uh, deductible. You should want to look at them and apply the test and see if you can accelerate the deductions for those. Um, the important thing here is, and, and I, you know, in, in the tax world, there's also this RD tax credit. And the important thing there is documentation, and this is similar. Uh, in that, if the IRS comes and looks at the deduction you took, they're going to ask you, well, why did you deduct this? And if you kind of look at them and go like this, then they're going to probably smack you on the head. Um, so you want to have the documentation to support what you did. Um, you know, it's a consider, you want to assess, you want to think about these things and determine whether they're capitalizable. Uh, one more. And this is the, uh, the, the gibberish at the end that says, you can't sue me for anything I said to them. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and while it's always painful to listen to tax stuff, uh, ask my wife. Uh, she never left her talk at home. Um, and, and this is you know, a 15 minute summary of 400 pages of regulations. So I appreciate your attention. And to the extent of building uh, developers and owners, and this is something you should think about. Thanks. Providing him insight into the needs and challenges of his business owner clients. In addition to business owners, his clients include business executives and other professionals, both active and retired. He provides customized financial planning and investment strategies that are tailored to each of his clients' unique circumstances. George graduated from Franklin and Marshall College, where he was elected to membership in Phi Beta Kappa. He holds both a certified financial planner and chartered retirement planning counselor designations. Please join me in welcoming George Canis. Thank you. Um, first of all, and I'm not being paid for this endorsement, I must tell you that Cone Resnick, I share, we have some mutual clients, and they are a uh, first-class firm. They do excellent work, and I, I've seen it with, uh, with the clients that we share. So again, I'll expect the free drinks afterward. Okay. <laughs> but, but anyway, I was asked to talk a little bit about 
financial planning and um, how it applies to some of the folks in the room, or everybody for that matter. And I thought it might be helpful if I talk about some areas that cover everybody and then maybe hone in on a few minutes on some of the um, areas uh, specific to business owners, which we have in the audience, and also real estate owners. Um, financial planning, I'm just going to set this down here. Financial planning is a, um, a comprehensive approach, excuse my back, is a comprehensive approach to looking at a client's entire situation, their assets, uh, their income, their goals, uh, what they're looking to accomplish in life, and trying to come up with a plan to see if it's possible for them. Uh, one of the areas that is very important, and I want to talk a little bit about, is uh, retirement. Um, you've all probably seen all the studies about how people are not prepared for retirement. and I go back, I'm over 30 years uh, doing this, and when I first started, a lot of folks, and not just municipal employees, but a lot of folks had defined benefit pension plans. So they would retire at 62 or 65, whatever the age was, and they would get a pension which would last them through their life. No matter how long they live, they would have a pension. Fast forward 30 years, corporations have realized, hey, that's an expensive proposition. We can't afford to pay somebody who might live to 90 or 95 so what do corporations do? They switch from defined benefit to defined contribution, the so-called 401k plan. So the onus now is on the individual to do their own saving, to do their own investing, and make certain that they amass enough money to get them through retirement. Um, again, in 30 years, what's changed a lot is the life expectancy. Uh, right now, a 65-year-old, a person who's turning 65 now, has a 25% chance, one in four, of living to age 90. <laughs> so you take a married couple, that's two folks that have, the odds are 50% that one of them is going to live till age 90. People still try to retire and want to retire as early as possible. 65 is a, you know, an age that a lot of people choose, so they've got another you know, 25 or potentially 30 years to cover themselves in retirement. So there's a lot that goes into that in terms of amassing enough funds to be able to do that. I mean, I have clients that I have to plan. I mean, 90 is, you know, that age, but there are people living much longer. I mean, my, my wife's family, for instance, and I have to do the planning for my, my own family, her grandmother died just shy of her 103rd birthday. Her grandmother's brother, who played golf three days a week up until he died, was 96 years old. So I know two things. I've got a plan for probably 100 in terms of my family. And if there is any inheritance coming from my wife's side of the family, I've got to wait quite a while. So that I know. But the challenge really is, and, and I, um, I guess Jeff's really passed out some stuff, this little piece we have on uh, longevity planning, and that's basically this whole topic about having enough money to cover yourself. And um, it's important to come up with a systematic plan uh, or formula to, to access your, your, your investments, because you don't want things, obviously, to run out. You don't want to live to 95 and your money runs out at 85. That's not a good thing. You know, I think we can all agree. So that's one, one of the major challenges. The other challenge that I see, and this is uh, kind of an offshoot of the longevity, is uh, health care costs. And most specifically, long-term care costs. I mean, the, the, the statistics are that probably 50 to 70 percent of us at some point in our lives will need long-term care. This to me is the biggest pothole, and I know we've been driving over so many potholes these past few weeks. This is one of the biggest potholes to be having a successful retirement, is incurring these large costs for um, long-term care. Does anybody have an idea in Westchester, and I went through this with my mom who was in a facility for a while, Anybody know what the going daily rate is for skilled nursing care in, in this area now? $400, exactly. Okay? $400, that's $146,000 a year. So if a 65 year old, and that's going up more than inflation, that's probably going up 4 or 5% a year. So if you're 65, and typically the age that a person needs long term care, 
is around 79, 79 or 80. And that might start with home health care and so on. But in essence, if you just inflate that uh, $146,000, 5% a year, that's over $300,000. The average stay in the facility is three and a half years. That's a million dollars. So that can be an incredible draw or drain on one's retirement account. So what you should be thinking of and what people would advise people to think about is what do you do? And there's long-term care insurance. If you've got significant wealth, you can choose to self-insure if you'd like. But it's just something you should consider when you're planning for your retirement because that unfortunately looks like a real positive possibility with a 50 to 70 percent chance of that. So that's, that's the other long-term care. Now, I'm just going to touch on a couple of business areas that, that I think impact what I see in my practice and things that I find are overlooked. And one of them is business succession planning. Um, you know, take an example, you've got a few people starting a business, three, three uh, unrelated folks, and, and they've, you know, over the decades they've built a great business, maybe now it's worth $10 million. One of them dies. What happens next? And most businesses don't have a plan in place in order to make arrangements for that eventuality. Um, and so what happens? All right, so that person dies and his or her spouse now is a one-third partner. Do you want that partner, that person who's not an operating individual in your business? Probably not. So how do, you, how do you make sure that doesn't happen? And there's a couple of ways. Well, the main reason is, main way is you set up a succession plan. And within your succession plan, you put a buy-sell agreement in place. And basically that specifies when a person dies, what the uh, value of the shares will be worth. And you have to spend some time on this and use a formula or a metric that applies to your business. You can't just put a, well, we'll say it's worth X amount of dollars and put it in a drawer of the, the, um, the contract because then what happens is times change and the business changes. So you need a formula in place, whether it's book value, cash flow, um, whatever formula you're going to use. Then the other part comes in, and my example of $10 million, this partner who died, his or her interest is worth $3.5 million. Where does the money come from to pay to buy them out? Because, you, again, in my example, you don't necessarily want their spouse as your partner, or a worst case scenario, maybe not as bad, or maybe worse, they decide to sell the business to somebody else because you don't have the money to pay for it. So buy-sell agreement, and typically people will fund the buy-sell agreement using insurance. So if there's life insurance on the owners, one owner dies, the money is available in order to pay off the, um, the heirs. So that's one very much overlooked part of financial planning. The last thing I'm going to mention is, and this is uh, specific to business owners, but also those who own a large amount of real estate, is the estate planning issue. Right now, the federal uh, exemption per person is about $5.4 million. I think it's $5,430,000. If you die and you have less than that amount of money, you pay no federal taxes. New York State's a little different story, but I'm going to ignore that for a moment. What happens is if you have a lot of real estate or an illiquid asset when you die, and let's say a person has $30 million worth of real estate, and a husband and wife own it jointly, they die. Um, right now, and they've got $20 million which is subject to uh, estate taxes. So the federal estate tax starts at it's 40%. So that's $8 million. All right, now including New York State, which is about 16%. So figure 50% if you live in New York, so you owe $10 million. So where are you going to come up with the $10 million? If you're fortunate enough to have a liquid portfolio, stocks, bonds, and cash, you can use that, or your beneficiaries can use that. If not, it's going to have to come from your real estate, and that's going to have to be sold. And the government requires the estate taxes to be paid in nine months. Oh my God! How would you have liked to have? Well, for your ch children's sake, for your beneficiaries' sake, what if you passed away in, let's say, 2008? How easy? And what kind of price do you think your beneficiaries would have received trying to sell real estate in that environment? Oh my
been terrible. You know, so if you have an illiquid asset, you have to do some planning uh, around estates if you're, you know, potentially in that that uh, circumstance. One of the things that you can do is, if number one, you can build up uh, individual assets so you have the money outside of the uh, the real estate. The other thing we do quite often is use life insurance again to pay off the um, pay off the estate taxes, and typically it's held outside of your ownership in a trust, so it's not considered part of your estate. Okay. So with a husband and wife situation, when the second spouse dies, the insurance policy pays off, and the heirs can use that to pay the estate taxes, and they don't, because that's liquid, and they'll get that right away, and there's no issue about having to sell, sell real estate. So again, I know this is a, you know, a quick breeze through this, and I, I just wanted to hit what I thought were a few of the topics that I thought people don't pay enough attention to. Retirement, obviously, one of the main um, main concerns of all of us and, um, and and what's involved with that and also the other issues of succession planning and uh, estate planning. So we have a couple minutes. I'll take any questions you might have. If I scared everybody, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, when you need the service, how do you handle somebody who comes to talk to you? Well, typically, um, there's two ways. I typically am uh, I, I'm fee, I'm on an advisory basis, so I, I charge a percentage of assets, and that's primarily how, how I work. I do occasionally do individual plans for folks, depending on the, uh, the, the complexity of the plan, I charge a flat fee for that. So you are service? Yes. If it's, in, if it's in the client's best interest, there's sometimes it's not, but then 90% of the time it is. You should have both. Typically, um, you should have what's called a pour over will. And I'm not an attorney, I don't play one on TV either, so I've just you know, a little bit out of my area. But as a financial planner, typically I see with my clients. You're going to have a because in, in invariably you're going to inevitably you're going to forget to retitle an asset, and in the event that you do forget, the will will cover the disposition of that asset. So if you have ninety eight percent of your your things titled correctly in the living trust, that's great. But maybe you forgot about something, and the will will cover that. So you typically you'll have the living trust, and then you'll have a pour over will. It's called a pour over will. Living trust. Yeah. Okay. Is that it? Everybody's experts now? Great. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the individuals in this room are, you know, small business owners. Yeah. I mean, they don't have a 401k sure. or another retirement. Yeah. Yeah. What recommendation I mean, well, can you give them mm -hmm. in terms of maybe, you know, thinking and actually yeah. implementing a plan to, you know, put some money in the stock yeah. in the future? Yeah. Great, great question. Actually, having a small business you might have more flexibility and more opportunity to save on a pre-tax basis because um, there's a lot I've worked with a lot of actuaries and, and plan design folks and you know the government basically says look with ERISA the Employment Retirement Income Security Act you can't really discriminate in terms of how you make contributions and so on but you can you can go to a legitimate planner not myself I'm talking about people who do plan design and you can come up with a uh, plan where you can favor uh, the owners of the business. Typically, they're they're older than their their employees. So that's one of the things I would suggest to do is look at your situation in terms of putting money away and putting away on a pre-tax basis and maximizing the amount you can do. I mean, quite frankly, I mentioned that defined benefit plans are probably mostly extinct right now. But if you have a business. Um, you can put in a defined benefit plan. If you wanted to really ramp up the amount of contributions you could put in, you could put in over six figures a year on a pre-tax basis. So that's one strategy. So you'd have to kind of look at what your cash flows are now, what they look like in the future, and then you can come up with a plan. You have to sort of test it, but um, I know a lot of folks will just you know, do that analysis for nothing and just see if there's a plan that works for you, and if it favors the owners to a great extent and makes sense for them, then that's something um, I think they can put in place. Mm -hmm. you yes? You mentioned uh, insurance. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. The, 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 is the 
cost of the premium is tax deductible? Um, Maybe that's a tax question. Yeah, it's more of a tax question. I'll probably, uh, I'll probably turn to Cone Resnick on that. It's not deductible. It depends who the beneficiary of the Children. In in what? Let me just let me clarify. In what's in? Give me a scenario in terms of the insurance. Well, who, who purchased it? For estate planning? Yeah, for estate planning. Yeah. Well, because estate planning purposes, it's, it's going to be held in a trust, right. and that's not going to be when you say deductible in terms of the premiums. Right. No, they're going to be typically paid. They're going to be typically gifted yeah. by the let's call it the parents into the trust so they'll uh, take yeah. take advantage of the annual exclusion amount yeah. or any of their 5.4 million dollar and those gifts there won't be any tax on it but they won't receive a deduction for it uh, okay yeah. well then you would use you could use part of your you know your annual exclusion amount the five point more because the, the gift tax and the estate tax are base, basically equalized now so you would just File a gift tax return for that amount, and then you could you would just be eating away at that 5.4 million. But if your corporation is paying those premiums as far as the five thousand, yeah. uh, yeah. if the, the, the premium that the policy premium will not be deductible if the if someone other than the corporation is beneficiary yeah. of these yeah. policies. Yeah. But that's different from that's on the buy sell side as opposed to I think your question was more on the estate plan. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Many thanks to George Canis of UBS and, of course, Richard Shavak of Home Resnick. To our members, thank you for attending tonight's membership meeting. To our non members, we hope to see you again. If you have any questions, call the VR offices. Arrive home safely. Have a great night.